Sayyidat Wasada. Staff of the World Economic Forum, I would like to express our thanks for your presence with us today. I would also like to start by thanking our host, the Jordanian people, and the co-chairs of uh, this conference, and all relevant parties, members, and partners, including the young global leaders and the global shapers and uh, members of the Global Agenda Council. I would also like to thank you all for supporting us, working with us hand in hand during the preparatory period for this international forum. We've been preparing for it over the past few months to ensure its success and all of our success and to create opportunities for transformation on the ground. The Middle East and North Africa region is witnessing transformations on all levels. with special focus on the on comprehensiveness. In this crucial period, we need to make tangible and pertinent decisions for the region. This forum is organized under the slogan, Creating Opportunities for Growth and Economic Sus Resilience. The objective of this conference is to translate the social transformations of this region and the political and economic uh, changes to use them to ensure that they come up with tangible results that are beneficial to all members of society and to ensure that we find a solution for problems of unemployment and income disparities and to develop the infrastructure and the private sector. Last but not least, of course, we need to ensure transparency in governance. Allow me to thank you again. I hope uh, I wish every success to this conference and thank you very much. Professor Schwab, the floor is yours for the session. Thank you. Mirek Dusek, uh, director responsible for the MENA region and for this meeting at the World Economic Forum. We start our proceedings with this first uh, panel session uh, devoted to the topic advancing growth and resilience. And I have the great pleasure to be, to welcome here four outstanding panelists. First, of course, uh, the Prime Minister of the Hashemid Kingdom of Jordan, Dr. Abdullah Enzur. I also welcome, if I start to my left, uh, Ibrahim Dabdoud, uh, Group Chief Executive Office of the National Bank of Kuwait. Uh, you are co-chair of this meeting. And uh, Ibrahim, I want to use this opportunity to, to congratulate you for the many uh, special mentionings your bank has achieved uh, in the last months as an outstanding financial institution. Bravo. Are on our advisory board, so yeah. that <laughs> I um, welcome Chu Min, uh, Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Uh, he is also, I welcome you particularly cordially because you are also a member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum. Thank you. And you are here not only based on your present position, but you have a long career uh, in banking, in central banking, and of course also as a world-class economist. And finally, 
um, Martinsen, the Group Chief Executive Officer of the Zurich Insurance Group, Switzerland, one of the foremost global insurance companies. Uh, he is also, I welcome you also in your uh, capacity as, uh, as co-chair of the governors uh, of the World Economic Forum for the Financial Industry, and of course co-chair of the meeting here. I would propose that we proceed in the following way. Uh, the theme, I repeat, is advancing growth and resilience. We listen all to your opening statements, to your short opening statements, and afterwards we will uh, go more into depth with some specific issues. Uh, Prime Minister, may I ask you to take first the floor? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schwab. Your Royal Highness, uh, Prince Faisal, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply honored to be speaking before such a distinguished gathering of international leaders and world businessmen. At the very beginning, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for believing in Jordan to hold this very important global economic forum on the shores of the Dead Sea. It also gives me great pleasure to welcome the distinguished speakers, as well as the participants from different parts of the world. Following a period of robust economic growth during 2000 till 2009, Jordan GDP averaged around 6.5% as global and regional conditions deteriorated, we started slowing sharply in 2010 to 2012 to an average of 2.7%. Unfortunately, global and regional challenges were exasperated by the continuous disruptions to the flow of natural gas from Egypt and by the continuous influx of refugees from Syria. As a result, the budget deficit widened to 9.7% of gross domestic product, GDP, and the public debt expanded to 75% of GDP in 2012. Moreover, 2013 is going to be a challenging year as Jordan's economy continues to face the consequences of these external negative shocks. The measures taken in 2012 and early 2013 and those planned on the energy sector for the rest of 2013 will help reduce the budget deficit, excluding grants from 9.7% to 8.9% in 2013. Capital expenditures, though decreased in the year 2012 to reach only 680 million JDs, that's about $900 million. The government, with the help of GCC fund, is aiming to gradually increase capital expenditure, especially in proportion to current expenditures, to reach about 1,300 million JDs. That's about $1,600 billion, $1,000.6 billion, and then to $1.5 billion dollars in 2016, and this is, to the, this is the design to sti stimulate the national economy. As we have been emphasizing, the government of Jordan is fully committed to implementing its program with IMF. We believe that the reforms recommended in the program will strengthen our national economy and gradually boost our economic growth rates. We are already seeing positive signs in terms of strong foreign reserve levels 
of fiscal consolidation on track and of higher gradual growth rates. We are confident that the reforms we are taking will lead us towards economic recovery and future prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. To show us how Jordan, in a very difficult situation, is uh, still advancing growth and trying to strengthen resilience. Now, let's see from the perspective of a global business leader, Martin, how do you see the situation? Thank you very much and uh, good morning and excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to express my thanks to uh, His Excellency the Prime Minister for receiving us so well. This is my first trip to Jordan and when you go someplace to the first time you have expectations and you really do only know on how these expectations are met when you're there. And um, coming from Europe, um, you're also influenced by many different factors and media and so on and you only hear about it and then you're here, then you make the experience and I must tell you I'm so positively surprised about the spirit, the warmth on one is welcomed, and for that I thank you and all you people very much. And I obviously also want to congratulate you for this special day and the Independence Day today. Now, with regards to the view I have uh, for this region, we have obviously a lot of challenges, and we have heard, we have heard some of these challenges as well from uh, the King's speech. But with that, there are as well very much opportunities, and I want to look at the opportunities. And the opportunities, I must say, are about looking for the economies to further diversify the economies. And there are good examples on other countries which have done that. I would just like to mention Indonesia, which has been a country very much dependent 20 years ago, 30 years ago, on energy exports and oil exports, which is now diversifying into manufacturing, into renewable energy, and uh, into tourism, as many countries do that as well in this part of the world, and that is a very, very good start and a very solid foundation to create jobs. I was yesterday in a discussion with some business leaders and uh, political leaders, and I was very impressed about the openness of the public sector and the private sector talking about some of these challenges and opportunities, particularly as well as it goes to education, and even vocational training. One of the business leaders from some of the Middle Eastern countries was talking about on how his company is now training people very much in, the, uh, in an apprenticeship uh, approach. And anyone going through this training at this uh, company will have a job guaranteed after two or three years of this training. And this reminds me very much on the system. We have a dual education system in Germany and in Switzerland where it is not just a, an academic career can be pursued, but as well very much vocational training, which I think is a very, very important base to build on that in all Middle Eastern and uh, North African, and as a matter of fact, around the world, I believe, to be very important. Keep in mind, we have big challenges as well in Europe. In Europe, we have countries with youth unemployment way above 50, even close to 60%. Many countries in Europe, particularly in the southern part, they're not fighting with low economic growth, they're fighting with recession. And we have very much similar situations and challenges, or I would even say bigger challenges in, in Europe than one has here. And I see that the spirit and the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector is very much alive. This is the basis to continue on that note. I also think a, a very important part, and I see also signs of this happening, is to bring much more the women into the workforce in this part of the world. And there are a lot of good touch points where this is happening because this is a, a fantastic, tremendous resource to support the build-up of the economy. And uh, I think this is a very, very positive uh, uh, step. Now, just in closing, one more word. As I'm in an insurance company, our business is basically risk. And we have a lot of customers in this part of the world which do business outside of the Middle East where we help them to mitigate these risks. And we have customers, both individuals and companies in this part of the world, and we help them to manage these risks here. And I think the, 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 the fact 
that there is a dialogue ongoing that many of the challenges are so openly discussed is a very, very important and good step into the right direction to build a formidable platform to continue to grow. Thank you, Martin. Dr. Chu, seen from uh, Washington, you have to deal with many problem countries, and I know you are also engaged now in negotiations uh, with some countries here in the region to support the reform processes. What do you have to tell us? Well, thank you, uh, Professor Schwab, and uh, thank you, Prime Minister, for the invitation. Before to the global, let's start with local. I consider I myself as quite a good swimmer. So I went to swim in that sea yesterday. So after floating on the water for a few seconds, I want to swim. But obviously, you swim in that sea require completely different skills. So I end up drinking a lot of, a lot of salty water. <laughs> so the lesson is, in local, you have to know local things. What is the local situation? I would say growth still remains the key challenge for the region. I very much appreciate this conference for the growth as a key issue. I think it's absolutely important for the region. Because after the crisis in 2009, the growth dropped to roughly 3%, then rebound in 2010 to 55 and around 5 in the next two years. But once again, we forecast the GDP growth for this year, 3% far below from 4.8% of the GDP growth we had for the region last year. Why weaker growth? I think the first issue is the global economic have a moderate recovery, which reduced the external demand for the region. I think it's very clear. But the growth in the region last year in the three and a quarter, and this year also three and a quarter, but why the region GDP growth rates will drop from 4.8 to 3% this year? The key components of the GDP growth drop is really from the oil export countries. The GDP growth rate drops from 5.7 last year to 3.2. Obviously, the oil demand in the world is weakening, and the price is also softening which has a big impact on the region GDP growth. Because we're looking for the globally, Professor Schwab mentioned global pictures, we forecast a three speed growth rates. The first emerging market low income country have around 6% GDP growth rates, and the Europe still in the recession below zero. Americans on the solid recover around two and a half. But the key issue is the emerging market growth rates are slow down. For example, China. The China GDP growth rate two years ago from 10.2 dropped today 7.5. India, 9.6% two years ago dropped to today 6. Brazil, 7 to 3.5. Russia, 7 to 3 and below the 3. And the emerging market being the major the, the import for the regions commodity and energies. And we forecast, for example, if a Chinese economy drop 1% GDP, we'll have roughly one to two tenths of an active GDP drop for the region. And in Europe, if 1% GDP drops, we'll have roughly two, to, uh, two tenths to four tenths of GDP drop for the region. So when emerging market GDP growth is lower, the euro growth is lower, region facing the external pressures on the commodity exports. So the main drive force in the past four years, the strong commodity exports, strong increase the commodity exports, particularly improve the term of trade, and the strong investments on the energy sector may change. They will change the whole situation for the region. We need to be very carefully concerned with the new situations. Because we had a lot of debating with ourselves with the three quarter and a quarter GDP growth rates for the whole world. Is it still a moderate recovery or is it a new norm? 
and look more and more like the global are going to experience a moderate growth rate in the next few years. So then, region really need to focus shifting away from pure energy and commodity export to more as a modern machine, diversify the economy. I think it's absolutely important because regions, non-oil export is so weak. And by the way, the regional non-oil export are doing quite well, actually. This year, we'll forecast where growth were from 1.9 to 2.7. Let's give the hope. That means without oil, the region can grow. I think this is a very important uh, message uh, and to the region. So the few policies are absolutely important. The first policy is we need a macro stability policy. We need a fiscal policy. Be carefully support growth. For example, region spend in every 9% of GDP doing the energy subsidy. If we do the energy reform, we can save a lot of money for the public expenditure. We we'll promote the growth and enhance the job. And we need fiscal policy spending to promote the growth and also on education and health care to promote the long-term growth for the, the skilled job creation as well. And we need a long-term structural reform as well, more diversified, more balanced, and uh, I think there's a lot of room to do. We, during my experience negotiating with regions on the terms, we thought a lot of potential in the regions. Region has a lot of space. We are confident with the policy change, with the, the macro stability and the structural reform, region will be able to move to high growth paths. We are very confident on that. The International Monetary Fund is very much committed for this region. We uh, had an $8 billion program in Jordan with the Prime Minister and uh, uh, in uh, Yemen and in um, in Morocco, we just reached a staff level agreement with Tunisia on 1.75 billion uh, program as well. And we do a lot of study for the region. So together, also with the form, bring all the business community and the political community together, I think we'll be able to use this huge potential to push the region to the high growth in the future. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. May I just ask you one question following up the long-term perspective of having global growth reduced by 1.5% compared to the past trend. Could you just mention what you see as the reason behind? I mean, it's probably technological progress or um, satisfaction of some of the basic needs in some of the emerging countries. But could you just elaborate on this yeah, point? Global growth will remain quite moderate in the next few years. Yeah. I think that's the basic things. But the, so the external demand will, will be weak. But for the region, the most important thing is the emerging market growth and move to the new, new norm. So that's a sort of a permanent shift which will change the external demand equation for the region, which is very important. And uh, Europe still remain uh, in a very weak position, which is also another big uh, demand for the region as well. Mm -hmm. So overall, but uh, if you're looking for the region, the non-oil export country actually were doing better this year. So that gave us a confidence. The region can do a good job with a proper policy reform and implementation. So you would see a growth potential for the region, certainly in the order of 5% plus in the long run, if the reforms are undertaken and the macroeconomic stability is assured. Yeah, in the, in the past five years, the region roughly have 45 uh, to 5% GDP growth rates, and the region have absolutely potential to go back to that level. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Ibrahim, you as uh, being so active in the region, uh, how do you react particularly also to the um, uh, comments which you heard, and what is your assessment? Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope that the, the, uh, at the end this, uh, this, uh, this area will be able to really achieve 4 to 5%. It's not, it's not going to be 
that easy. The, the road is, is really long and, and arduous. It's really long and arduous. And uh, I hope that eventually it will be able to tackle the needed reform and change. Because, uh, first of all, different countries uh, have different needs. If we, you know, I always say we have many Arabs. It's not just one Arab world, many Arab worlds. The, G the GCC, the non-GCC, North Africa, and so on. Each has its own characteristics and, and its own uh, problems. Uh, but I think uh, definitely we need a large coordinated effort or plan to channel resources and know-how in the region. Uh, the challenges at the, at the economic level, we need definitely a economic uh, stabilization in transitioning countries and, and long-term solutions. Uh, in many countries in the region, we have fiscal and current, current account deficits, and, and most of them have widened, really. Foreign exchange reserves declined, and, and me as a banker, uh, I always have, always have a look at, at foreign exchange. Reserves. Uh, tough reforms have uh, to be made really to, to, uh, to the expensive uh, subsidy systems. Uh, I know it's, it's a very sensitive political situation, but again, we, we have to, to do something about it. Unemployment is on the rise in many Arab countries. And what's even worse, suspicion and mistrust mistrust over big business and the private sector by, by, the, by some of the pub, public sector. The, what's the role of the, of the international community or the oil exporting countries? The international community, the G8 at the, at the Deauville partnership, they, they committed $30 billion. Only a small portion has been, has been spent so far. And I have been talking about an Arab Marshall Plan for the last 10 years. I talked so much about it that I started really to believe myself. <laughs> it's uh, ideal. It's definitely ideal. But it's, it's probably the only solution, of course, with tough conditionalities, very tough conditionalities, and a joint formula of the IMF and World Bank together, together, and again with tough conditionalities because otherwise uh, you will have a lot of problems there. At the political level, the political liberalization, the democratization faces definitely a, a challenging legacy. State institutions are weak and ineffectual, legal systems are not independent or impartial in many cases. Civil society remains relatively underdeveloped in many cases. Popular engagement in the democratic process is limited. All of the above needed for successful and resilient economy. This should be the base, really, of a resilient economy. Again, as far as the political system, elections are not sufficient. Low voter turnout, a question of legitimacy. Democracy is not just about the rule of the majority. It is about protection of rights, liberties, the rule of law, and the governments being representative. Now, after painting such a rosy picture, to, this, to, the, to, to the Arab world, it doesn't mean that I am I'm giving up hope. On the contrary, I think that the new generation with enough and good education will be able really to do wonders. We have, we have our young generation who have the opportunities now to really uh, come up, especially, especially if we have the right education. And, and I think we need probably another two sessions for education, but 
uh, as far as, as I am concerned, this is good enough. And again, I, I, I keep repeating the same old story that at this phase of our development, we need the Arab Marshall Plan. I'm sorry to, to be stressing on that all the time, but it's needed. It is definitely needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, Dr. Chu, would you, would you like to comment on this uh, issue of Marshall Plan? Because uh, as uh, 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 Ibrahim mentioned, it would require the cooperation of the IMF and the World Bank. Since uh, the president of uh, Kuwait uh, said he himself now become more and more believe in his uh, idea Marshall Plan, and uh, I think I shall agree with him. Uh, the first issue is region have a tremendous space to improve the public expenditure, which is not enough. Yeah, in infrastructures and it's not only on in, uh, the energy related investments, but more on the public uh, investments. So there's a room to need. There's uh, uh, particularly in the, the, the transitional economy uh, in, the, in the region, there's uh, room for international community to play. The external financing is extremely important for this group of countries. For example, we forecast in this year another around $4 billion is needed to support these countries and move and into the new stage. Um, so international community obviously and play a very important role uh, in these countries and, and overall. We, as we say, that we're committed for the region for the programs. We are negotiating more programs currently, and we'll be happy uh, to working uh, with uh, the international community. Particularly, our job is to maintain macro stability. Uh, I'm happy to, to listen to the president. He says, uh, much more stronger conditionality. That means more stronger than IMF conditionality, which is good. We're obviously happy for that. Thank you, Min. Prime Minister. Um, with, in the aftermath now of the Arab Spring, the expectations of the populations have grown and you are submitted to extreme expectations. On the other hand, you have to enact all those reforms which to a large extent require some painful action at the beginnings. How do you maneuver between those two different um, dimensions? Prime Minister, yeah. you addressing me. Well, thank you very much, sir. I'd like uh, first to comment on the on the uh, Marshall Plan, between brackets. Uh, I, I wonder whether this Middle East can prosper, uh, whether can it be stable, while we have two wide differences of income. I think we have to look at the region as a whole, as a unity. We cannot have countries that are very well doing and others that are lagging behind because stable stability in the region is a climate. It cannot be confined to a piece of the Middle East without the rest of the Middle East enjoying the same standards of living. So I think a Marshall Plan would be a great idea to be considered at the very high level of like IMF, World Bank, and other organizations. Now, as to the second question, uh, Professor Schwab, uh, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. Our country here, Jordan, which is uh, an example, hopefully, of stability, of advancement, very high standards as to the system of education, as to the system of health, as social welfare, all indicators are in the, in the positive. However, that's not enough because the resources are meager and our people are looking forward for more prosperity, but we cannot accommodate all their ambitions given the limitation, as I said, of our resources. So this is how we can strike a balance 
between the availability of, of resources and the ambition of the nation to go ahead with prosperity and advancement. Thank you. Prime Minister, I think it's very important in this respect, and you are doing so, and His Majesty is doing so, uh, to integrate the population by showing a longer-term vision and uh, um, getting the mind out of the um, uh, short-term uh, situation only. Um, Dr. Chu? Yeah, I uh, very much agree with you. I, I would like to uh, commend the Prime Minister for the success uh, putting on the constitutes, then be able to put on the long-term government, long-term right. vision, and be able to include and bring people on board to working together for the long-term objectives. I think it's absolutely important. So we're very happy to see that Jordan, uh, Jordan is moving into the right trends, right direction. I think it's absolutely, absolutely important because transitioning uh, economy in the region facing a few key challenges, very complex political transitions, number one, mountain social pressure because unemployment rate is very high. And the very weak recovery, I think that's also, I just mentioned, the growth will drop to 3%, adding the pressure on, on, on the growth. And the private co sector confidence is still weak. So those things added together, so make this transition become a longer. So it's very important, the country like Jordan is committed to move forward. I think this is very important, put a long-term pers perspective in the area. But also I would like to take this uh, opportunity to, because there's a lot of private sector. I think it's absolutely important for the region to have a private sector leader growth. So the government working on the business environments and the private sector and should help the region to recover because that creates a job and the growth. But also I think the international community should play their role. They should deliver what is, whatever they promised. I think this is very important. This year and the next year, in these two years, is critical for the external financing support to help the region move further. I think this is very important for the international community. Continue support this ocean and deliver whatever they're committed. Long-term vision, support, but there was another element which was mentioned uh, by you, Ibrahim. Uh, you were, you expressed yourself, I would say, in a skeptical manner on the state of uh, public-private cooperation uh, here in the region. And I, I would like to, to turn to Martin Sen. Um, when we look, let's say, at public-private uh, cooperation in Europe, in the United States, I think it's relatively well established. How, how do you see the need, or based on your, on your experience around the world, about this uh, importance, critical importance, of having uh, governments and business working hand in hand? Thank you, Professor Schwab. This is, uh, of course, a very, very important aspect in sort of forming the base for prospects in this part of the world, and in fact, in any other area in the world. And, uh, as uh, Min Tzu has mentioned, this collaboration and uh, the common understanding is really key. And I see that, I must say, from the short discussions I had so far, I see that as well happening. We should always keep in mind that the private sector looks always at risks and returns. And, that, and risks are uncertainty. And you only can make an investment that you have a certain certainty that you get your investments at least back. And in an ideal world, you want to even have a return about your initial investment. And if you don't have that sort of insurance, call it, or that safety, then one is holding back. In other words, you don't have the confidence and the trust. And the collaboration and the visible collaboration between any private and any public institution is undermining and supporting this trust. So it is very important that it's not only visible in terms of common agreements, but it's also followed up and being agreed upon to form these public-private partnerships as a basis. But what is also important is that the framework in any economy is sound and it's predictable, that uh, the laws and the regulations are predictable and not flip-flopping and changing ever too often, that they are supporting the business 
as a basis to as well nurture that. And I must again stress here that uh, from the discussion I had so far, I see that this is happening. That is a lot of discussion on education. There is a lot of discussion on diversification of the economy. There's a discussion on how to go about uh, the law and the order and how to move forward there. So I can only talk for my institution. I'm, I'm fairly confident uh, with this space is happening that there is a basis for continued uh, development in a challenging environment. But this is not only challenging in this part of the world. We have that across the world, as um, Minsu has mentioned, with economies somewhat being at more sustainable levels developing. So very important is private-public partnerships and very important not only to deal with the issues now but as well to have a vision on how to move uh, prosperity forward. Thank you, Martin. Um, Mr. Abdul? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Do you Mr. want Schultz. to comment on it? Yes. Uh, basically in the Arab world, and I'm talking about the Arab world here, uh, the, the public sector is, is, uh, is the prime mover of the economies. The contribution of the public sector in many economies is very high. And that's, that's our main problem. The private sector is not active enough. Although the public sector should be the one who would, should facilitate things for the, for, the, for the private sector. Because the private sector is innovative. And this, it is the private sector which will create jobs in the future, not the public sector. If we're talking about 85 or 100 million, million uh, jobs to be created in the next 10 years, the private sector should be the one who should move. And I think this is, and in many cases in the Arab world, the private sector uh, has, has proven itself very well if, if they are allowed, if they are allowed by the public sector. And I'm talking out of uh, experience. Which means you do not have only a relatively smaller private sector, but you also have a private sector which is much more dependent on governments and the public sector That's compared right. to other regions That's in the right. world. That's right. And I, I would like to commend uh, Dr. Ensour with all the difficulty for lifting the subsidies, for example. That's, that's one step that, that he should be commended on. I know it's tough, and I know it has been very difficult for you, but it's... Tell the deputies over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we are coming uh, to an end of uh, this panel discussion, and I would like uh, to ask each of the panelists one question and want to have a very short, precise answer. Uh, Prime Minister, we spoke about public-private relationship. What are you expecting from the private sector? What is your advice to the private sector? In my country, the public sector is one of the largest uh, worldwide. Uh, you wonder if you know that uh, the size of that public sector is around 45%. It has to do with the, uh, with the birth of the nation how the nation was born, what was the role of the government. So the government was almost in every, every domain, every domain, it did everything. Uh, ranging from the army to bakeries and to raising goats and all that. But now the trend is that we are withdrawing. We're withdrawing, the government is withdrawing at steady steps. And that has, does not have to do with any uh, certain government, this is, the, uh, this is the country of Jordan that's heading to that end. So a smaller public sector, a smaller private sector. However, the relation between both uh, has to be also uh, uh, examined, the relation between, between public and private sector. Uh, uh, still, the, even if you privatize, uh, still the public sector is dominant. The regulations, so I'm talking here about the regulations. Therefore, one issue has, uh, that has to be addressed is deregulation. It's not only privatization, but also deregulation. Because in our case, there is many a company that's private sector, but it is completely owned by the public sector. 
So we have a peculiar uh, expertise that uh, should be studied, and uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, the the private sector is still reluctant to play the role that we envisage necessary for it to play. Thank you, sir. So, Prime Minister, you would say the private sector has to be more self-confident. More self-confident, and uh, but the government has yeah. also to be more uh, modest. More, so, yes, modest. Uh, I I would. Uh, Add here when we talk about private sector, I think it's not only an issue of privatization. Uh, I think, uh, and we do not have the time uh, to create the entrepreneurial environment and to allow young people to become entrepreneurs and to create a new type of private sector is very is very essential. Let me ask our two uh, business leaders um, if you had one wish, maybe two, but short, to governments. What would it be here in the region, Ibrahim? If we, if you had one wish, to governments, uh, let I'm go. the angel, and I give you two. Just wishes. let go. Let go. I mean, don't, <laughs> don't control every aspect of the economy. Just let go. Your role is basic. <laughs> <laughs> Your role. <laughs> Your role is basically to, to, to monitor and to watch and to control. That's all. But the, let the private sector uh, move because the private sector can be innovative with all the, the, the uh, uh, really the brains that, that are in the private sector. Martin, that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You had two wishes. No, no. No, no. no take two, the second no, one. No. One yeah. wish is it's good enough. <laughs> I, I think I have to agree with Ephraim and uh, what, what my wish would be to be more principle-based rather than very strictly rule-based, to have a common agreement on the principle on how to govern, say, the business and less so strict on rules. And by the way, this is not a wish for this region only, this is a wish I have for the rest of the world. And frankly, in many parts of this world I see where it's flipping a little bit too much to very strict rule-based sort of behavior because we're not only in an economic crisis, say in Europe, but also in a crisis of confidence. And I hope that we contain this trend, that it's becoming a bit more principle-based. And I just want to, in response as well to His Excellency, the Prime Minister, say that in principle, we have the same objectives, the public and the private sector. Our objective is to create value to our stakeholders. And in my case, my stakeholders are our customers, our employees, our shareholders, people. And these people together form the societies, the communities where we live and work. So eventually we have the absolutely same objectives to create prosperity, well-being, employment, and I hope, and that's my wish, that the dialogue can continue as we have it to build that base and that we not only the private sector, but also uh, not only the public sector, but also the private sector can let go with each other for the benefit of both. We should probably speak more about um, welfare creation and less about economic development, because yes. when you speak about welfare creation, you have the common interest, really, of governments and of, of business. Now, um, I know you wish, uh, um, Dr. Chu, is that Europe gets its house in order, that the United States continues to, to create mm -hmm let's say, to, with the upswing in, in the economy, and so on. But what is your wish, really, for this region? And what is your recommendation, in one, if you had one wish? I think uh, the region has uh, tremendous potentials. So I very much wish the region, the first issue is have an understanding of a changing global economic situation and a growth pattern, and has a profound impact on the region. I really see a game changer here. And also, so the region need to have urgency to manage the macro stability because the slowdown growth will have a profound impact on the government fiscal deficits and the current account deficits as well. And also, the region have urgency to continuously promote structural reform and put the region into the long-term sustainable and inclusive growth path. 
Thank you, Dr. Chu. This concludes our opening panel, uh, and I wish uh, you, the participants, uh, a successful meeting over the next uh, 36 hours. And I would like, on behalf of all of you, to thank our panelists for the interesting discussion and dialogue we had this morning. Thank you. Thank you.